Realize it, but computers are everywhere around you. The car that your parents or even you drive, the refrigerator in your kitchen, everything's got a computer embedded in it. The way I see it, computing really is the future. I am a software development engineer at Amazon. Began making uh, computer games as a teenager, and ultimately went to the uh, the Ying Wu College of Computing. I did my research in an area called computing education research. So the reason I got into this field is because I was a TA for introductory programming course uh, when I was at UC San Diego, and I found that a lot of people came in with these preconceived notions about computer science being too difficult, uh, that it wasn't for them, it was only for their smart friends, it was only for boys, and I definitely don't think this is the case. When I was applying to colleges, NJIT was the obvious choice for me. I'm in college to learn how to be a great computer scientist, and I was convinced when I visited NJIT that this would be the place to do it. I am director of the NJIT Cybersecurity Research Institute. My particular claim to fame is I ran one of the early implementation teams for a kind of technology called homomorphic encryption. I recently co-founded a startup called Duality Technologies. Dean Craig Gotsman, he has been especially supportive of faculty entrepreneurship. His experience has been extremely useful to me as I integrate students into research that I do that would have broader societal benefit. In my experience so far, there's been a huge welcoming community between the advisors and the fellow students. Not just fresh undergraduates, but even students that have been in the career for a long period of time and are coming back to school. I think this tight-knit community here at NGIT is really open and they're here to welcome you, whether you're trying to study or pursue your thesis or dissertation. All these options are available for you and we're all here to help. Ranging from the very philosophical to the very technical, there's a very broad range of things that you can do. Um, people normally think of computing as something that only geeks and nerds do, and to some extent that's not completely uh, incorrect, but computing is used in fashion, computing is used in sports. Um, we have uh, several sports-related projects going on. Computing is used in gaming, entertainment, um, health, there's a lot of different applications for computing. My classes and my colleagues' classes are specifically designed around the, the career prospects of the students. The main job market happens to be mobile, augmented, and virtual reality, so we start right on the phone. Mobile development, we move right through augmented reality on the phone, we move into virtual reality on the phone. We give you all the skill sets that you need as a designer and as a developer. I personally came from this college. I found that the quality of education and the price point, its connection, the transportation to New York City was a, a great opportunity for me for internships. I have classmates who went to, some went to Google, some are at Microsoft, uh, Verizon, a number of uh, various companies. Uh, so definitely, definitely a lot of, a lot of opportunity coming out from NJIT. <laughs> Greetings from New Jersey Institute of Technology. I'm Mike Smullen, Executive Director of the Alumni Relations Office. And I'm very pleased to welcome you today to our latest Highlander chat with Dr. Premislav Mazalski, Associate Professor of Computer Science at New Jersey Institute of Technology. His research interests are computer graphics, geometric modeling, geometry processing, and digital fabrication. He develops new algorithmic solutions which help designers to create products directly on the computer, averting the need to manufacture preliminary prototypes. Prior to joining NJIT, he headed the Computational Fabrication Group at the Center for Geometry and Computational Design at the Vienna University of Technology in Austria. He obtained it his MSc degree in Media Sciences in 2007 from the Bauhaus University of Weimar and his PhD in Computer Science in 2010 from the Vienna Institute of Technology. From 2007 to 2011, he was v with VRVIS Research Center in Vienna and from 2011 till 2012, he was the postdoctoral scholar at the Arizona State University. I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Mazowski to our program today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks very much for the introduction. So, as already said, I'm coming from computer graphics, so this is like my main field, and I will talk today about uh, shape optimization for digital uh, fabrication in this subfield of computer science of, of computer graphics. So, let me start ahead. So, first of all, in uh, computer graphics, 
we do a lot of 3D modeling. So in computer graphics, we create 3D content uh, for various um, applications like gaming, games, but also, also for architecture, but also for um, entertainment industry and so on. But most of this content for animations, for example, doesn't leave the computer. But recently, we also started 3D printing. And of course, then we want to have like physical copies of our objects. But when we just model a 3D object, a surface on a computer and 3D print it. So what happens, with it? How, do, how does it be behave? What happens with a 3D printed fish when you drop it into the water? So indeed, most likely it will either sink and lie on the bottom or it will float on the surface. But what you would like to have is a fish which is well controlled with floats, uh, in a in a pretty pretty fine manner, so as a fish would do, and in order to do so, not only the surface of the object is uh, of interest, we also need to account for its mass distribution. And this is a project we did uh, quite a time ago, in order to optimize uh, objects to fulfill such physical goals. So what we want to what we want to do here is optimize the shape. On the one hand, on the other hand, we want to keep the original shape as close as possible to, to what the designer did, so that we don't want to change the shape too much. And we want to do it as fast as possible. This should be something which pretty uh, immediately delivers uh, a result to the designer. So let me go a little bit more in detail here how this is done, okay? So we represent the shape as a polygonal mesh. So it's basically a mesh composed of polygons. In most cases, we just use triangles because they are very efficient. And we will call it here the surface, the input surface S. And I will now just mm, look at only on the cross section, so only on the silhouette. So let's call the surface of the object S. And what we want to do now is create two other surfaces, okay? So S uh, underline and S overline, which are like, offset it of the original surface such that the space okay between those new created surfaces basically constitutes a solid body and this is actually the mass which we will 3d print when we are using a 3d printer so and we can represent this just from a given uh, 3d object as a as a mesh as uh, so-called offset surfaces. So basically, let me get a little bit more uh, mathematical here. We can use this very simple equation uh, where we look at the points on the original surface and we just call them xi, okay? So we say on the original surface, we have points, we call them vertices xi, and then we have a vector which points away, okay? We call this vector vi the vector points away from the surface. And then by moving a point along this vector, we arrive at a point x i underline. And this point x i underline is a member of this uh, outer surface here. And this is the one we are looking for. And we can do it in uh, both directions and for all points in our polygonal mesh. And in such a way, we can create two different surfaces such that the space between them will basically constitute the physical body, which we want to 3D print, okay? So, and what's the problem here? So what's the question? Let's assume we have this initial surface and we have those vectors, they are just perpendicular to the, to the surface. And now what we want to do is we want to compute all those offsets, all those deltas. So how much do we move a point away from the surface such that when the fish is 3D print, its center of mass and the way how it floats is properly distributed, okay? So the problem now is to find those offsets values delta. And this can be formulated as an optimization problem. I don't want to go too much into detail, but we can formulate a mathematical optimization problem with a so-called objective function, which uh, which would say you can you can literally think it will make the shape float, so distribute the mass such the shape floats, and and subject to keep it in such a way that 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 it has an upright orientation, for instance. Okay, 
It's an optimization problem. Uh, and the var var variables of this problem, so the unknowns, are all those deltas. Those deltas are all those offsets. So how much you want to go along each point. And, and as you can imagine, this is a huge optimization problem. You can think a little bit about an optimization problem like a system of linear equation in some terms. It's not exactly like that, but in, you probably know what a system of linear equation is. And it is a huge one because we have n unknowns and n is the number of vertices. And we can have input objects which can have like thousands or even ten thousands or even more uh, input vertices. So they can be very dense and detailed. So you have a system of linear equations with thousands, ten thousands or even more unknowns. And, mm, and we can solve it, but it's very inefficient. So it scales very badly. It's, it's underdetermined. That means that there are a lot of solutions which may, may be good or bad. So it's, it's, it's not a very good formulation, we can say. It, it works sometimes and somehow for limited models with not very good results, uh, but it's not really good enough. So what can we do to improve that? And here we came up with an idea. Let's say we want to reduce it uh, and we want to pro reduce it by, by finding a s other space where we project the problem into another space. Okay, it's a mathematical space. And here the idea is to produce it to a space which is so-called uh, the manifold harmonics. Okay, maybe for some of you it's known. So manifold harmonics like the generalization of spherical harmonics and the spherical harmonics, uh, it's like the generalization of the Fourier transform to objects in space. So what, are, what do I mean? We look for uh, so-called basis vectors where the frequency of of a certain shape can be uh, decomposed and used as a combination. So let me let me show it to you graphically. So here, what we see is like the first manifold harmonic basis vector. So it's a, just a constant offset. So we have one value. Okay, this is one value here, which, which is varied. And when we vary this one value, uh, we constant constantly for all of the vertices. We just get a constant offset. And OK, it might be good enough when you just want to have some certain thickness around uh, of your object. But it is it's not enough to balance it. You can't just uh, move more mass to the front or more mass to the back. You don't have this degree of freedom. But when we look at higher frequencies of those basis function, and here we look at another one, we see that we can move the mass in a certain other direction. It's like the next basis vector. And here already we have something which is not really constant, not linear. Okay. And when an increasing frequency, as you can see now, okay, we can have few of such, such basis vectors. Here on the left hand side, you see that uh, there is a certain increase in, in variations on the surface. And what we can do now, we can compute a combination of those such that the combination of those give us the offset we want to have. OK? So when you look at that one here on the bottom, it already deforms pretty weird. But when we have a linear combination of those, we can find a linear combination which gives us exactly the deformation we want. So basically, we project those offsets onto those bases, I, I call it here gamma, and we look at the linear combination, which means I, basically linear combination is a weighted sum of those basis functions. And what we want to find now is only how to weight them. And since we only have one single scalar value now per basis function, how much of this basis function should contribute, the problem reduces to a much, 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 much slower pro uh, optimization problem. So in other words, the unknowns are now the, I didn't call them alpha here. So the contribution of each basis uh, now, of each basis function. And if I take only few basis functions, usually it's enough because they are low frequencies or we don't want to make like jaggy surfaces. We want to have smooth surfaces. So I just take maybe, maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe, maybe 100 usually 100 at most. So I reduce a mesh, which would have 
maybe 10,000 of vertices and 10,000 of unknowns to a problem where I have only K unknowns and those are just like maybe 100 or in the range of that. So you can imagine it's a huge uh, difference in computational complexity and it has also other advantages, advantages like it's numerically stable and it's an irregularizer, which means it makes the, the in inner surfaces on the smooth, not jaggy. So that helps us actually to uh, solve it very efficiently. And we deform only the low frequency. So that means that even if we change, uh, if, if we change like a little bit the shape, the small details on the surface, they don't change. So when we have scales on top of your, uh, on the surface of your fish, which would be like considered high frequency detail, it doesn't change. We don't touch it. It remains as designer created it. And we have used this for a couple of different um, mass property examples we have created. So what we can do is we can, uh, of course, also optimize for static stability, so object is safe, but also for rotational uh, stability. So we can balance the mass within a varied object such that the axis of rotation is the one which we, which we choose. So we can have objects which are perfectly rotational symmetric with respect to a chosen axis. Okay, we can do toys like a, this uh, Rolly Tolly Bunny. Um, those are, of course, examples uh, how we can distribute mass. Oh, there are very many applications of that. In computer graphics, we usually play with uh, some fancy uh, geometric objects just to demonstrate uh, the possibilities of our algorithms. Uh, this is yet another one. Example here, we have optimized the bottle a tilted bottle, we have optimized in such a way that when you fill it up with ethanol, okay, some of you maybe also know ethanol under the name alcohol, so um, it will stand, okay, it's filled up, it's tilted, we fill it up with alcohol, it stands, but now, look at that, when we fill it up with water, it actually tilts. So what happened there? The bottle is optimized in such a, such a way that exactly on the border between the density of uh, ethanol and, and water, and water is more heavy, and that's why it will leave the bottle, uh, will let the bottle tilt. Of course, we have also a bottle which, uh, which stands with water. So yeah, that might be a bottle. You can check the amount of alcohol in your drink. So another extension of this idea was, um, Okay, when we can do the mass, let's think about vibrations. And vibrations uh, constitute them as sound, okay? So basically when we strike an object, it brings it into vibrations and this constitutes the sound it exhibits. So, and typically like uh, the sound and the frequency of the vibration is measured. So for example, the 440 Hertz of vibration is the concept pitch A sound, which you hear also on your phone or on this old style uh, uh, landline uh, phone. So that's the signal. And here the idea was, okay, when we, we can modify the modes, those, those vibrational modes in such a way that we create shapes, which give us the desired sound, okay? So we extended the idea we had prior, prior to that. So here again, I'm going to talk about shape optimization. And in order to understand what we have done here, I need to give you a short introduction into optimization. So here we have a function uh, of a shape, just abstract function phi i of a shape. And let's say phi i is mm, the frequency, okay? And here we see how the frequency changes in, uh, across some shape parameters, okay? As just describes the shape, how is it forms, okay? So when we deform the shape, the frequency changes. And now we want to have that the shape has the specific frequency, okay? Let's say 100, okay, 100 hertz. And this is like this phi star, i is our goal frequency, and in order to move the shape into there, we compute a, we formulate it as a squared, uh, as a, as a, this, this difference uh, of squares here. So of our phi i, so this is our desired one, and this is the given one. And when you see here, this function has a minimum when the shape exactly matches 
what we want. Okay, so we want to minimize this. So this is an optimization problem. And in other words, we want to bring the shape such that this function has a minimum. So basically to this location. So in other words, we whatever shape we give, we have to change the shape in a way that along the function, uh, which describes the shape, we move to this uh, minimal point. However, this problem on the end is a high dimensional problem. So this is not like just a graph of, of this one curve. It's a higher dimensional problem, and usually the, dim the dimensionality is uh, here for <clears throat> how many properties we want to optimize. This is not too, not too big, okay? This is the, uh, in the range of maybe 5 or 10, but uh, the shape is parameterized with a huge number of parameters, let's say with our, our manifold harmonics from before, so let's say with 100 parameters, okay? So altogether, it's a high dimensional problem and also very difficult to solve. So you can think about this in high dimensions, about this curve now as a surface. It's not only in 2D, it's even higher dimensional than 2D, but in 2D, it gives you already some impression of space. And now we want to find such a minimum, okay? So such a lowest point in the surface. And it, there are different methods of, of doing that. We came up with one which uh, speeds up a lot of traditional optimization, and we call it uh, subspace projection. Okay, so we said, okay, let's try to reduce the dimensionality because when we just do it in this full high dimensional space, the current convergence in this particular case is uh, pretty bad. So convergence means it takes long and doesn't always deliver good results. So what we did, we introduced subspace projection. So we say, let's reduce the dimensionality of sp the space and project it locally to a lower dimensional space. One more time. So, okay, what we are doing all the time, dimensionality reduction for a more efficient um, computations, optimizations. So you can imagine what we do here is we find the best direction we want to go towards some point of minimum, the best we can find here locally. We still don't know how to get there, but we can find one locally. And then we uh, take this direction, make a cut through this high dimensional surface. It's still more than 2D in, in, in truth. It's just a depiction. And then we, we move just in this low dimensional. So in this case, I just depict it as a curve in order to find the minimum until we find the minimum. Okay, and then we repeat this procedure again. Okay, so we project it on this. Okay, you can think like a cross section line. And now again, we move until we find a minimum. Okay, and again, and we repeat and we repeat until we get into a minimum in this high dimensional space. And without going too much into detail here now, the advantage of this whole thing is that very expensive computations, the computations of the gradient actually, so the gradient is the vector of the first order derivatives of this, uh, of this space, is uh, reduced to a lower dimensional space. So it's just less computations, way much more less computations for evaluation of the gradient. So it has the advantage, it runs faster, and in fact, uh, not only this inner loop is, is computationally less expensive, it also delivers very good results. So here I want to show you an example. Oh, actually, here I have a, a sound example. So what you have seen here, let me repeat this slide. This is a fabrication of the results we can compute with our algorithm. So we fabricate uh, such glockenspiel stones, okay? Again, we take some animal figures, and then we create an animal glockenspiel. Uh, so, and we optimize for each of those keys a particular sound, which is overtones, so it's not only the pitch, it's also its overtones. And here's an example. I don't know, can you hear that? I really hope we can hear that. And if not, then <laughs> we should overlay the sound back again once it's done. So 
This project allowed us also to extend it to other applications. One more time. So here we see some performance. And just to give you an idea of the improvement of this subspace projection is, when we look at these graphs here, these graphs mean here uh, the objective value here on the vertical axis, we want to have it low. We want to have it actually zero on or as low as possible or even below in, in some cases. I mean, so it means we want it to have towards zero. Let's, let's put it in like that. And we want it low as fast as possible because it means we have converged to this local minimum we have seen before. And these graphs show different trials with different starting values. And the blue graphs show traditional optimization in this full space. And the orange graphs show how it decreases over time when we optimize it using our subspace projections. And the steps we you see here in these orange graphs, those are actually these changes of the subspace. So each time a subspace, subspace we have some measure to, to, to compute it, doesn't work very well anymore. Okay, we're starting to diverge. We switch the subspace to another one. And here, those steps are the switches. But as you can see, we converge to much lower values, so better quality, in much lower time. Okay, some of those traditional ones, they don't even converge. Here we see a convergent convergence on the, for the uh, giraffe, but it's after 14 minutes, and we can converge in four minutes. So <clears throat> that was an improvement, and it, since it is a structural optimization also of this uh, of the shape, we can apply it also to other applications, like for example, for example, modification of the shape such it can withstand more uh, load. Okay, so we optimize now structural strength. So here's an example. Let's say we have this kitten model with a constant offset, and we want to, and it withstands a force F. And now we want to uh, measure it where we can measure it or simulate it. So here we see actually where it will yield uh, after the uh, force is applied. But now we want to optimize the shape such it, that it can withstand twice the force. Okay, so we say minimize the volume, so minimize the usage of material or the mass, but at the same time, make the shape, change the shape to withstand twice the same force. And now after our optimization, we get such a result. So the wall is thickened and certain regions where, well, the algorithm decides it's necessary. And it shows us in our simulation and prediction that it will yield at that location. And we actually measure that. So you can see here, yeah, we, we squeeze the small kitten. So about that, in graphics, we do some brutal experiments sometimes. Um, so, and we see the kitten yield basically exactly at the location it was predicted, and it yielded at around uh, 1,000 newtons, okay? And then we took our improved kitten, did the same thing, and yeah, it also yielded here as predicted in our simulation, and it yielded at around 2,000 newtons, so twice the force, okay? So obviously, uh, yeah, that worked well. <sighs> yes, at that point, I would usually take some questions, but since we don't have this opportunity, let's go ahead. I want to introduce another project also of shape optimization in graphics. So here, our idea was to create uh, optimal seats for our sophisticated optimal seats uh, for humans. Uh, here, inspired, for example, by special designs by Azaha Hadid. Uh, so those designs look very nice, but we don't know if they are actually comfortable. Okay, So the idea was support designers in creation of sophisticated shapes, but at the same time, give them some idea Will this thing, after <laughs> it is designed and before it's fabricated, will this thing be actually comfortable? So 
here we developed a simplified uh, model of the human body with friction and pressure. I don't want to go into much detail in this project, so let's uh, skip it and just uh, look at the high level ideas. So here basically we compute a pressure distribution map on the body, which we then use. Uh, we can do it for sitting and then for lying. So just to just to show you that we measured with state of the art um, professional software, and we developed a very simplified model, which is not exactly very. It has some error, but it's very fast. And the error is small. So for the purpose of design, we thought, okay, that's that's okay. We introduce some error, but at the same time, we are very fast when we can do it in real time. Then we have an. <clears throat> Also, a formulation of an optimization problem for uh, the for the surface based on subdivision surfaces. So let's do not go too much into detail there. And now we can we can uh, create, given the input shape. Okay, let's say this is the input shape. We can create different deformations of this of the seat uh, the sub body support surface such that we uh, maximize this area where the body is supported. And this is like a measure of comfort, okay? So when you just want to have a high peak, you sit on a very high peak, it's not very comfortable, right? So you want to have your body supported in a large area such that the pressure on certain positions is distributed on a, as big area as possible, actually. So this is a measure of, of comfort in, 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 in some way. So that's what we did and developed an method which supports designers uh, for this uh, yeah which supports designers and gives them immediate feedback and also improvement during the design okay we also we worked that project with students of architecture and design so we recorded different poses using a motion capture device and then uh, we had like uh, around 70 poses recorded for different um, body positions and then a designer could just choose a couple of poses and in an interactive uh, modeling software here like Rhino which also has supports now uh, in, a, in a plugin our algorithm could design a body and the, the algorithm has automatically uh, corrected and adjusted the design and the surface the architect was dealing with in such a way that the this comfort, this measure of comfort of sitting is maximized. Okay, so we also fabricated using an industrial robot from Styrofoam and Prototype. Uh, it was also uh, in collaboration with students of architecture and design. And yeah, and we tested it and uh, most people found the surface very comfortable to sit and lie. Okay, so since I wanted to show you a couple of uh, project, I switched to yet another one. So in this project, the idea was to create uh, surfaces. Uh, the general motivation here comes from architecture. So the idea is to create surfaces which can be spanned, okay, and remain under constant tension. And this tension also forms actually the surface to a desired shape. So here's an example. Let's have a look at something like that. This git, this uh, this grid is flat. It's totally flat. It can be uh, assembled in a flat state. And then when we deploy it, it forms a spatial surface. Okay. And this is the basic idea. Uh, be behind uh, this uh, project. So we want to have a way to create this dome-like structures, which can be deployed from totally flat 2D structures into these 3D surfaces. And at the same time, we want to have them a little bit more sophisticated. We just don't want to have, you know, boring domes. Okay, everybody can do domes. So we were thinking, yeah, let's, let's do more sophisticated surfaces. Let's give the designer, the architect, the ability to create something uh, more <clears throat> sophisticated than that. So the idea here is uh, 
combine geometry and physics because th there is actually a lot of differential geometry in the background but the bending itself it's a physical problem so um, the the uh, i would say the project objectives they focused on this close match between geometry and physics because we wanted to avoid expensive computations again or i would say computations which take a lot of time okay we, we want to have it approximately such that the designer can have a result in a matter of seconds or minutes but not, not that he needs to wait for hours or longer uh, to compute as co sophisticated physical simulation so and here we start this project like that. The, the designer creates a target surface. The target surface is something that uh, he wants to have. Okay, so he says, "I want to have an approximation of this target surface," and he needs to choose four points on the surface. And this basically constitutes already the boundary of the scissor-like grid. So on the end, the problem is to find a matching between the surface and the planar grid, which when it is planarized, okay, is basically a, a, just a quadrilateral. So to do so, we introduce a couple of geometric considerations. First one is, let's say we introduce these coordinates along the boundaries. Okay, we call those parameterization. So we parameterize these uh, shapes such that starting here on those points, we have a coordinate axis u1 along this edge and u2 along this edge. Okay, and also on the 3D surface, we want to have the same coordinates u1 along this uh, boundary curve and u2 along the other boundary curve. And as a matter of fact, those length, the length, must always be the same because our wooden lamellas you have seen in the example they are not stretchable okay so the whole grid all elements they must must have the same length in 2d and in 3d they only can bend they can a little bit they can twist a little bit but they cannot stretch okay and such curves okay on the surface can um, which combine two points on a shortest path are called geodesic curves. And what we do now, we are looking for geodesic curves on the surface with matching lengths in 2D domains so or in this planar domain. So having this parameterization, okay, now we can introduce the shortest geodesic curve between two points on opposite boundaries. Okay, so you can imagine the length from this point or the, the connection from this point to this point on the other hand on the other side along the surface so you must move along the surface there exists in certain cases a unique connection and this is the called geodesic curve so this is the geodesic curve and it is unique so from this point to get to this point there is this one shortest distance okay they are not unique in in uh, in a total generality but for a certain class of surfaces we use here it is the, this case and now we can just use those coordinates here. So that one was given and that one <coughs> was computed because we were searching for this path. We can now put them also in 2D here on our parameterizations because U1 is the, has the same length as U1 here and U2 has the same length as U2 here. So we can place this as a connection in 2D. And since this is a geodesic, its length is con constant here on the surface, it has exactly the same length here in 2D. So basically we can place this lamella here in 2D. So now the question is, can how can we find the grid? Of course, we just repeat it on the other direction. So we take those points and we say, okay, now we uh, parameterize those curves, boundary curves with V1 and V2 and 2D edges with V1 and V2 here. <coughs> And we have just repeated the same thing. But now the question is, we want to have a grid, okay? How to find this grid? And the other question is, what angle 
alpha and this angle alpha is how much do we collapse this uh, 2D quadrilateral should we use? And in order to determine it, <clears throat> we have introduced something we called uh, distance maps and cladding functions. So the distance map, you can imagine when we just take one point here on, on the uh, boundary curve and we, we uh, draw so-called distance field. So basically those uh, circles, all points on each circle have exactly the same distance to this original source point. And when we look where those circles intersect the opposite boundary, we can get, get all distances from all points on that side to all points on the other side. So basically this map will store all distances of all points along U1 to all points along U2. And this map can be expressed as a surface in this 3D space. Okay, so what is happening here? We have a 2D space, U1, U2, okay? And we have a third dimension, this is the D, and D is the distance. So basically, when you want to know what is the distance from this point on U1 to any other point on U2, so you just look up here, okay, U1, this is my point, and then you go up, this is U2, and now you look, the, you look, you look up the value on the surface. And the value on the surface tells you, so when you take a pinch here, the surface, take the value of D, will tell you what is the distance from this particular point to that particular point uh, on U2, from U2 to uh, U1 to U2, U2, or vice versa. It's, it's an invertible thing. So this gives us <clears throat> all connections between all points on, from the, across the boundaries. And the same thing we can do also for uh, the 2D domain. So we can do exactly the same thing and get the surface for 2D. And now uh, having uh, these two surfaces with U1 and U2 and U1 and U2 in both cases, we just overlay them. We just overlay them, okay? And now the intersection on the surfaces, so all points in U1 and U2 on the intersection has have the same length in the 3D domain and in the 2D domain. So that means that all points we on the surface correspond to a connection in 3D and in 2D with the same length. That means those are the candid candidates for our boundary, uh, for our members, for our grid lamellas. And now we can pick them. Okay, so here you see the projection on this intersection from the top, okay? And this black curve is our intersection curve. We call it cladding function. And now we can also change the angle. And if we change the angle, the orange surface will change because it depends on the angle. So as you see, uh, if we change this 2D quadrilateral, the curve will change. So now we can optimize for example, for the smallest angle and also for the best distribution of uh, members along, <clears throat> along those cladding functions. So all points on this curve are valid. Now we want to we just choose those which maybe look best or maybe are best distributed <clears throat> and so on. Uh, so this is our tool of choice to create such grids. But there's one price we pay. In fact, it has been proven by mathematicians already 100 years ago that we cannot have the same positions of those intersections in 2D and 3D. That's not possible. Actually, it's possible but for a very limited class of surfaces. Okay? We want to have general, more general surfaces. So in order to do so, we need to introduce notches, so sliding points. Okay? So from our setup, we can compute these small sliding points uh, which we called actually notches. So in 2D, uh, those connections are on the one side of the notches and during the deployment, they slide across here to the other side and uh, in order to um, have the best appro approximation of the surface. And we created a couple of um, more 
well pretty sophisticated surfaces with uh, a little bit uh, with varying curvature with positive and negative Gaussian curvature as experiments we have fabricated them all so we did the small models with lamellas uh, here you see like table size models Here's another example. This one is composed of two pieces because it was too complicated to have it made from one piece. So you see how it deploys. And we also experimented again with students of architecture and design and created a bigger one. Or oh, here's maybe one more example when we see that those structures are actually load bearing because they are under tension and this force, which forces them to this shape, also can, helps us to withstand loads. So they are self self carrying. So this is a paradigm of design, which is very much interesting in architecture at the moment because it's so compact. It's lightweight, small, fabricable. You can fabricate it in two D. You can easily um, deploy it. So it has a lot of advantages. So we also fabricated a bigger one. So we make a study, we wanted to do a pavilion. It didn't uh, didn't actually work out to build a full size pavilion. So we built one which was three by two meters and using a laser cutter. And we used also such Teflon, uh, Teflon uh, stickers here to make the sliding, the fric to reduce the friction on those notches for a better sliding. And yes, and as our students here deployed, yeah, this medium sized pavilion here. Okay, so finally, only very briefly, yet another project in computational fabrication here, we wanted to create images which emerge from a set of spanned strings okay it's an idea of string so this gives you an idea when you span a string and you span a string and you span a lot of those strings finally you end up with something which emerges as a picture and we found it very interesting and we analyzed this mathematically and we came up again with an optimization problem so as you see what we solve mostly are different types of optimization problems First task in optimization is to formulate the problem. Second one is to solve it. And actually the formulation is usually the more difficult task. So we figured out how to formulate it as, a, as an efficient uh, optimization problem. I don't want to go too much into detail. And that this is public, uh, published. So for those of you who are more interested, they can look up on my webpage. All my papers are accessible uh, online. And we also used the industrial robot again as a proof of concept to fabricate such uh, string and imagery. And yes, and it was a very, very nice uh, successful project. So what you see here actually are photographs. So this is an input image. This here is a computation. This here is again input image. This is a computation, and that here is actually a photograph. It has been photographed with backlight and good quality. It really looks uh, pretty perfectly the same as our uh, simulation. So um, just to give you an outlook, so what is also the research uh, on my research ad agenda and for the future. So definitely geometric structures and geometric materials, so materials composed of small elastic structures, but the elasticity is actually given by the geometry. So here we are also working on optimization and simulation method for this type of problems. And also uh, machine learning for geometry. So what we want to do in, in, in that um, area is use machine learning to automatically generate new geometry and here you first have to discover some meaningful parts so high level geometry editing so as you can see all those different shapes they have handles they have like the body uh, and they have like different parts which have very different geometry 
but their meaning, so the semantic or the purpose, is the same. So this is one task of uh, machine learning to discover such parts, and the other one is to allow us to create geometry on a higher level. When you just say, okay, I want a bed, and I want to um, resize it and fit it into a corner, and the algorithm will compute automatically how to distribute all those geometric elements uh, in an appropriate manner. And last but not least, we are also working on layout design. So we want to create layouts for apartments. So where the uh, algorithm again generates generates data and it generates how to distribute your furniture within your apartment such that it's optimal. Okay, such that you have uh, the best distribution for your daily tasks and. This is something which can be learned from data by uh, observing existing apartments, adding some expert knowledge. We can train uh, neural networks, which will generate um, apartments, uh, apartment layouts, which are in some sense optimized. So a few words to my person is uh, I've been introduced. So I did my PhD 2010 in Vienna, Vienna University of Technology, I was postdoc at the ASU, I was postdoc at the Vienna again, an assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics. And since 2019, I'm associate professor at the Department of Computer Science here at HIT. And I think this is, this is all. This is the talk about uh, my current and recent research. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed it. Dr. Mazowski, thanks so much for uh for really an excellent presentation. And I want to thank you for particularly for boiling down so many complex uh, items into something that really was, uh, I think, digestible in so many ways. Uh, we did have a couple questions come in. I'm going to go ahead and put them on the screen. Um, so these are in order of when I received them. Uh, do you incorporate some kind of automatic error check to ensure that multiple models are agreeing on a final output for optimization? Um... So as I understand the questions, uh, the question, multiple models agree to a final output. Well, I mean, if we doesn't want to deform the final model, we can actually turn it totally off and only deform the server. I, I, I guess the question uh, regards this first uh, problem. So we can only deform to the inner uh, space, or we can penalize the deformation to outer. And yes, so in other words, the, the simple uh, answer to this question is yes, yes. We always take care of the error we introduce and we can either disable it or minimize it. That was uh, definitely a little beyond me in terms of some of the, the involvement there, but I, I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate the response there. Um, next question we had was, uh, this must have big implications in space travel. Is it being applied to space, Mars, on a macro scale in some way? Yes, this is the idea, for example, regarding the uh, deployable structures. So the idea is to have something which is very compact and easy to build, easy to fabricate. And on, on, the, on the one hand, so it's super lightweight. On the other hand, you can deploy it to sophisticated dome structures uh, with, with um, yeah, pretty easy tool. So indeed, this is an idea we, we think at, and this is also we we uh, plan to proceed in, in the direction we plan to proceed. There's actually a lot of research happening in that direction, light what structures which can be deployed. You know, I'm glad to hear you mention that. Of course, one of the things I was just reading was that uh, helicopter on Mars right now and how different it was because there was such a lack of oxygen there that everything changes in terms of how long it can go and what the materials have to be made out of. So that's a, that's a very good question. I'm curious to see where that yeah, leads. Yeah. It's a very good question, actually, yes. Uh, so our next question was, what, if any, are applications to gaming? Which, of course, is a big part of our alumni base. We've got a lot of gamers out there. Yeah, well, I mean, I come from traditional computer graphics. Uh, we did a lot of research in uh, geometry for gaming in 10 years, 15 years ago. Uh, I intentionally uh, switched a little bit into more into uh, applications which have also this physical part. So from that point of view, I don't really follow pure gaming in, in that direction. Of course, when gaming will 
might start also getting out of the computer and we have like a combination of gaming and physical uh, movement like um, with Nintendo consoles. So maybe there might be a bridge between that. So, but to, to answer the question, um, from that point of view in gaming, all which remains in the virtual world, it's not really computational fabrication. So it's a part of research I did in the past, but now I'm more focusing on the physical uh, domain as well. So just to answer the question. Okay. Uh, the next question we had pertained to, uh, actually it puts me in mind of NGIT's makerspace. 3D modeling relies on the production equipment, have making machines cut up with a level of detail you can produce, presumably uh, mathematically. Yes, uh, yes. The answer is yes. And indeed, I think both the, the, the developments in the hardware, I would say, the fabrication and manufacturing hardware, recent developments in the recent five or 10 years, they also inspired us on the side of software to deal with, uh, with, with those uh, um, tools and machines and with this domain, because they allowed us just the happening of uh, this desktop 3D printers, they already uh, brought a lot of movement in the geometry uh, scientific community uh, because we just could uh, improve our algorithms and in instantly check them if they really work on using a desktop 3D printer. So uh, yes, here we there is there is definitely a, a correlation between those two. Well, I'm glad to hear that it's uh, that it's catching up. Obviously, you want to produce it in as high detail as possible. And on a related note, the next question talks about processing power. Um, what you're doing must take so much processing power. What kind of software and what kind of hardware do you use uh, to accomplish that? Okay, so the truth is I'm using desktop hardware, usually. Software, I'm using mainly MATLAB. Sometimes I'm programming uh, things in C, C++. Uh, we also sometimes program shaders, GPU shaders, um, GLSL, HLSL. But mainly for the scientific computations, we rely on MATLAB. Some parts, in recently, we also do in Python. But my, I would say MATLAB is our main platform. And um, of course, it depends which computer you run your MATLAB on. Usually we run a desktop uh, um, computer with a powerful GPU because we also want to have some access to GPU to parallelization, but nothing really super specific in, in that terms. And uh, yeah, so that's the goal to optimize those algorithms to be to be as fast as possible on this commodity hardware. That is extremely impressive. Uh, I would have thought for sure that you had something, uh, you know, obviously a GPU would have to be involved, but uh, doing yes. it on, on desktop so uh, software and hardware, that is very impressive. Yes, I mean, some things we, we do on, on a GPU, we, we could also do it on a cluster faster, but on the end you know, on the end of the day, you know, it's not like, of course, we do it in machine learning. In machine learning, and the recent projects I was I was saying, I'm using, I'm using actually Colab, Google Colab, to, which runs on a GPU uh, cluster somewhere in, in, on the web. So I don't have like a big server uh, here uh, around. Uh, because it's actually more convenient to use uh, uh, computing services for that. And there you need those clusters. You need it for reasonable training of machine uh, learning uh, uh, networks. But for uh, shape optimization and all these geometry projects I have shown you, we just use commodity hardware. Well, I think that was a, a natural lead into our, our last question that came in, which is what companies are you working with? Um, which I, I'm, I'm curious as well. Do you yes. get a lot of corporate sponsorship? Is there a lot of corporate application that yeah, comes in your way? I must tell uh, the projects you have seen here so far, they are all funded by um, fundamental research funds, so governmental uh, agencies, and most of them are still by Austrian type of NFS, which because I was uh, uh, for a very long in Austria, I'm in the US, and now for um, one and a half years. So uh, most of those projects I have shown you uh, have been still developed uh, with my Austrian funding. Here also we try to get NFS, but I'm also working with Adobe, Adobe Research. Adobe is um, a company, a software company for uh, modeling software. So they have uh, connections with them and I work with them on projects, especially now in machine learning. However, this is also on the research base. So we are working with the research uh, departments of those companies. Um, 
So, so I try to balance it, but I try to keep it on the research base because this allows us to have this academic freedom and to try out things without the pressure coming from the industry. So uh, I try to balance it uh, to, to have also this sort of uh, fundamental basic research uh, funding for my... Well, I can understand that. I think that's uh, I think that's probably a good way to approach it. Uh, although I'll bear that in mind, we have a lot of alumni of companies that I think have uh, parallel interests and might be interested sure. in finding out more about your research. Sure. Oh yeah, definitely. If if so, because my some of the algorithms they are like done on a on a research level in order now to introduce them to the industry. There is still the transfer phase to be done because it's not like that if you take a research code implemented in MATLAB, you plug it into the software and you're done and you can sell your product. It's not like that. There's still right. still a, a long pipeline of the transfer of, uh, of research results to uh, to commercial products. So this is something which which uh, definitely can, can, can be done in collaborations with, with uh, research companies or with companies, software companies in general. Well, Dr. Mazowski, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a real pleasure, and I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So my name is Mike Small, and I'm Executive Director of the Alumni Relations Office at NJIT, and this has been our most recent Highlander chat with Dr. Premislav Mazowski. Thank you very much for joining us. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. You can also listen to us as a podcast on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And as I like to say at the conclusion of all of our Highlander chats, go Highlanders! <laughs>